what should the Muslims do in such a situation? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Today I want to talk about how or the Sunnah way of how David defeats Goliath. How uh, Talut defeats Jalut, as the Quran calls it. Um, before I talk about this, the first thing that I, the message that I want to send to our brothers and sisters, uh, you know where, where there is an onslaught right now. And I don't want to say it because you all know why I don't want to say it because then, you know, uh, Mr. YouTube then becomes uh, problematic. So the place in the Muslim world that has an onslaught right now, uh, those Muslims, they need to realize something. The Muslims in, in, in that area need to realize that the rest of the Muslim world has abandoned them, number one. Number two, they need to realize that even if other Muslim countries say something or do something, even if it's Turkey, even if it is Pakistan, they're going to do it for the dramatics of their own public and their own, uh, you can say, clout to claim to negotiate something to bring peace and so on and so forth. Okay. Number three, that the local leaders in the area, they, their political alignments itself is very, very problematic, many of them. They're not sincere to you, they're not sincere to your family, but they're willing to put you in danger. There are many thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of Muslims in that area that are very sincere to Islam. But there are also plenty of people in the corridors of power who see their self-interest and that is all that they see. They see this as a way to gain political maneuvering and how to get ahead and closer to the powers that be. And so they're willing to put your risk, life at risk with big slogans, big words and a lot of emotion that's been going on for the past few decades. The Muslims have been blindsided at many, many levels. So the question is, what is the Sunnah way for David to beat Goliath? And the simple answer is, what did the Prophet do? As a strategy. That when you do not have power, how do you deal with the ones who have power? And it cannot be emotional. Just because you got one or two firecrackers you can throw out there and make it look like we did something, when in fact you what you have, it, you haven't done anything. You've only created a worse situation. Let me explain. I'm not talking about halal and haram here. I'm talking about the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And that is that when the Muslims were in Mecca and the Muslims were being persecuted in Mecca, what was the command of the Prophet ﷺ? The command of the Prophet was ﷺ, Kufu aydiyakum, keep your hands tied, do not retaliate. Where is the Jalal of Umar in Mecca? Where is the anger of Hamza in Mecca? When the Muslims were being tortured, the Prophet was seeing it before his eyes and he was saying to the family of Yasir, Ya ala Yasir, inna mu'idhakum al-jannah, isbiru. O people of, or the family of Yasir, have patience, your place is Jannah. So the Muslims in Mecca were willing to die, but they didn't give any excuse to the on to the to the monsters that they should hurt them anymore. Even the Prophet ﷺ prayed in Mecca with three hundred and some idols around the Kaaba. Never dropped a single idol. If the Prophet was emotional or wanted to cause ruckus or didn't have a sound strategy, the first thing he would have done is gone to Mecca and said, "I'm the Prophet of Allah. I believe in one Allah." And one night, just start destroying or hurting the idols. He didn't do that. That's what we do. That's not what the Prophet did. 
And some of the people who have knowledge, but then not full knowledge, they will say to me, well, the Sharia is now complete. We can't go back to Mecca. And my answer to them is that when the sh in the issues that the Sharia is complete, then there's no going back like alcohol. One verse came, next verse came, next verse came, then finally finished. The ayat of Sabr of Mecca, the ayat that say, ahsan, that when they throw stones on you, you give them flowers. Those didn't get cancelled by the verses that tell you to wage a, 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 a struggle. Those verses didn't get cancelled. Why? Because this will always be a process of revival. And in the, in, there will always be times where you're weak. And there will always be times where you're strong. And so, when you are weak, you have to learn to take persecution and buy time out. And in that time, if you are true to Allah, if you are true to Allah, this is the archetype, as Dr. Umar likes to say. If you are true to Allah, then Allah will make a way in the timing and so on and so forth. Everything will happen such that what? That if you are true to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah will create a situation, makhraja. But it is not in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ to attack someone when you don't have the power to do it. And this is how many of the people have been using the Palestinians for their own advantage, for their own political clout. You have to recognize, the Qur'an says, that when you are strong, one believer can overcome ten of their disbelievers. And when you are weak, which we are, then one believer can overcome two of theirs. So, this gives us a ratio proportion. You must have a critical mass. First of all, that's in part of the, what would be called a standing army or a militia army or something like that, which you don't have. So, what do our brothers and sisters in that place, in that holy place, what do they do? What do they do in the Holy Land? They have to guard, as the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they have to guard the doors of Al-Aqsa. And they have to be ready to die. And they have to be ready for the media to see this. Let me explain. When you are in a state of passive resistance, as the Prophet was in Mecca, the average person was seeing, oh, Abu Lahab, look what he's doing to the Prophet. Look what these people are doing to Bilal. Look what these people are doing to Khabab bin Arb. Look at what these people are doing to Suhaib. Look at what these people are doing to the companions of the Prophet. It's so, they're such monsters and animals. They knew this in their heart. The average person. So when they were forced into the battle of Badr, they didn't have the will to fight. What the Muslims in Palestine have to do, they have to make sure the world sees what is being done to them. So that the hearts of the people can feel. That. Because what happens is, if you hit me really hard, and I hit you back even lightly, now, if somebody's watching that, you'll be like, okay, you know, who knows what's right. But when it's a one-way strike, which is what the Prophet did, and in that, doing that, the Prophet ﷺ was beginning to win the hearts and the minds of the people of Mecca, even before he left Mecca, so that when he came back to Mecca in Fatul Mecca, when the conquest of Mecca, the people accepted Islam and they already knew, they already had certain level of sympathy for the Prophet ﷺ. So, the strategy of the sunnah is, number one, you must be in the form of a jama'ah. You must be in a form of a jama'ah. Number two, you have to have sabr, and you have to guard the doors of al-Aqsa. And you have to be willing to die and your place will be Jannah. And you have to be willing to do passive, what is called passive resistance. You can kill me. 
I'm not going to do anything to you. And if you read many, 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 many sayings of the Prophet ﷺ about the end times, you can go to all the books of hadith and read them. This is what the Prophet was indicating over and over again. The Prophet says, when the time comes, don't be the first one to stray. Let them kill you. And the most important thing is to get yourselves right with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I can't tell you how painful I felt that even till this was in 1994 that I'm about to tell you about when I went to when I went to the holy place, okay? And what happened? The adhan was going on and all the youth they're what? Playing pool, playing pool table. Well, if that's the case, Allah's help is not going to come. You still don't understand reality. Either you're trying to escape reality or you don't understand reality and you don't accept reality. And as long as you don't accept the truth, you don't accept the reality, you will be essentially weak. Because you have to have strength to accept reality. When the youth in Sultan they stood up, they had courage, accept reality. And they made the steps and they took the steps that they, they had to make to save their Iman and to save their Islam. That was their priority. And so, each Muslim family has to know, each neighborhood has to know, each group of people has to know that they are alone. But they have a chance in this time of weakness, in this time of difficulty, to buy time, to protect the doors of Al-Aqsa. And they have to do this even if it means that it's a one way, there's no retaliation, no retaliation. You have to be ready to go. But you have to protect and you have the right to protect your right to protect Muslim, the masjid that we're talking about. And the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لَنْ يَغْلِبُوا إِثْنَةَ عَشَرَ أَعْلَافِ 12,000 لَنْ يَغْلِبُوا مِنَ الْقِلَّةِ If you have a brotherhood and a sisterhood of 12,000 people, you will not be overcome. And so the Muslims of Palestine need to realize that today they are weak. And rather than being like a little child that's hitting the older brother, that's not going to do anything, has not done anything, will not do anything, they need to accept the reality Allah has put them in and they need to act accordingly. Then the help of Allah will come. When you know, when you are in the field and you see the battalion that's coming before you is ten times bigger, it is sometimes better to retreat. It's just like when the Prophet said, you know, they're not farrahun, they're not running away, but they're just turning around to come back. Okay. And so, we have to be wise and we have to look at the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, and we have to understand that, that we have a lot of inside work to do before the help of Allah will come. And the Muslims in Palestine, they need to, they need to what? They need to work on their own situation with their own, Allah's help will not come until there's justice from within. Are your own leaders in the land, your own leaders, giving you justice? Now, is it better? This is distracting. I can't keep hold of my thoughts. Um, you talk to uh, Sheikh Omar. Okay, okay, just, just, so, just that. Allah used Omar Mukhtar. To teach the, uh, the by the way, everyone, his name is Omar Zaid because of his love for Omar Mukhtar, number one, 
and Zayd was the servant of the Prophet. Yes. And so then he gave himself two names, Umar Zayd, for that reason. Yes. Um, so he's talking about Umar Mukhtar in reference to what's happening in Palestine. Yes. You see, Omar Mukhtar was the last of the uh, Sufis to stand up to the enemies of Allah's cause in the earth. And the Ummah failed to support him. They failed to support him. He held out for 25 years or so while the Grand Sanusi tried to uh, warn the Sultan what was going on. He was prevented by the Freemasons who surrounded the palace there in Istanbul at the time, in Constantinople, really. And um, uh, the Grand Sanusi was, was never able to go back home. He was prevented by the enemies of Allah who were all over the Middle East in their free Masonic lodges. Okay, and these enemies included the Muslim Brotherhood. They included the Salafis. Afghani was a Freemason. His student, Muhammad Abdul, was a Freemason. They were the Grand Masters of the Lodge. These are not friendly to Islam. They are enemies of Islam. But the Ummah embraced them. Just uh, as a side reference, Muhammad Abdul. Yeah. He became Sheikh al Azhar at one time. Yes. He yes, was he. the in charge of Azhar at one time. Yes, he, he did. He had a big impact on the Muslim world, especially in the Arab world. Yes, he did. And he's the one who made uh, usury legal in Egypt for the first time. His friend was the, uh, uh, the British legate there. I forgot his name, but he was the owner of uh, the, the greatest bank. And uh, they. Together, they persuaded the Muslims to allow usury. This is haram. So meanwhile, Sanusi is fighting the Italian Freemasons. Mm -hmm. I know, I know that uh, uh, the president, uh, what was uh, his name? The dictator in Italy, uh, he outlawed Mussolini. Yeah, he outlawed the Freemasons, but that doesn't mean they weren't operative. They were always operative, see, and they were operative throughout the Middle East. Afghani put them in place in hand in hand with the British Freemasons and French Freemasons. The lodges are all over the Middle East. Some yeah, of them are still there. Yes. Some of them are still active. The evidence of that is the patches on the Saudis police. Mm -hmm. Those are Freemasonic symbols. Mm -hmm. see? So that influence has never ended. Omar Mukhtar stood alone against this influence, against his enemy. He and his men, for 25 years, 20 years, 25 years, fought and were successful. And they would have won had the Ummah the courage and the knowledge to do the correct thing. But they didn't. They ran after the Muslim Brotherhood. They ran after the uh, Salafis. And what did they do? Did they run forward? No, they ran backwards. They ran backwards. That's what happened. And so Omar Mukhtar and his people, his tribe, okay, they were the last great movement to stand like Salahuddin against the same enemy because they're the same cult. The Freemasons are the same cult that Salahuddin right. fought. Yes. Right. Yeah, they're they're the, the same people. Knight Templars and all of they're that. They're the same people, the yeah. same organization, the same kind of occult practices, the same kind of systematically organized evil. Mm. That's what it is. So, These are the same people now, not just the Jews. It's not just the Jews, because there are people above the Jews. Okay. 
And these are ancient families that you can trace back to Persia and Afghanistan. Yeah, ancient families. There are people who are families more wealthy than the Rothschilds. And many of them have taken on European names. Many of them have taken on Italian names or German names or, you know, these westernized names to hide themselves. But you never see them. You have to study the history. You have to read the history. You have to listen to the, the dons of knowledge who know about these things. And Muslims, Muslim alims don't do that. If they did, they would organize good. You see, Omar Mukhtar fell because justice was no longer organized systematically and upheld in Islam. So the Alim ran after the wrong people. They followed the people who wanted them to do what they were doing. They followed people who wanted them to stay scientifically ignorant. Mm. They followed people who did not want them to read the true histories. Mm. They followed people who just wanted them to pretend to be pious mm. and to pray and to pray and to pray and to pray and do nothing. <laughs> do nothing but pray. Look. There's a, there's a statement in the New Testament. I think it's by Paul, although I don't like everything that Paul said, but we can't believe <laughs> everything that's attributed to Paul is actually him. Mm. See? Because they, yeah, I'm sure he was borrowing a lot of stuff too. Uh, they, they toyed with the scripture so much, we, we don't. But there's a statement that was made there that is very, very true. And I share this with you now because this is the problem in Jerusalem. Faith without good works is dead. Okay. And the Ummah is faith facing death now because they do not have the right kind of good works. Say yeah. again? Yes, yeah, spiritual death. Faith without works is dead, okay? Now, Isa also said another, read another famous statement. He said, let the dead bury the dead. Well, that was, that's another statement that other people, you've heard me uh, talk about before. But, you know, it's told he to put these things together. Let the dead bury the dead. Faith about works is dead. What does this mean? Well, what, there's two types of death. There's the physical death and then there's a the spiritual death. You see, so if you have the physical death, that's not a big deal. You're just changing your uh, address metaphysically. You know? But if you're spiritually dead, that's the problem. Because spiritual death is the removal of all grace. It's the removal of Allah's grace. It's the removal of Allah's guidance, Allah's grace, Allah's favor, Allah's protection, Allah's provision. No more anything good. <laughs> it's gone. And what's left? Hellfire. That's it. So the Ummah is faced with death right now. It's faced with death there in Jerusalem. And so they cannot fight. It's too late to fight. The time to fight was with the Omar Mukhtar. And the entire Ummah abandoned him. That's why he lost. If the Muslim Brotherhood had crossed the wires that the Italians had laid down across the Egyptian Libyan border, he would have won. But they were too busy praying to do the right deed, to do the good deed, to support their brother in his struggle against their common enemy. They followed the British mandate. The British mandate was put up the wire, <laughs> support the Italians, cut them off from supplies, don't give them guns and ammunition, and especially don't give them men, Muslim brothers to help them fight off the enemy. 
Now, Omar Mukhtar held off a mechanized force for 20 years. 20 years in the desert, he held off a mechanized force, a modern army. And he only and he was on horses. And he was on horses, and he only lost because his Muslim brothers failed to support him in the Levant. The Arabs abandoned him. Everyone in the Levant, Levant abandoned him. Nobody came to support him. Nobody. Huh? So now you want support? <laughs> after 70 years, after 80 years of the enemy's victory, of the enemy's continually stealing and robbing and mass murdering, Huh? and causing division and all oh, what are you going to do oh you're going to uh, blow up a few people strap yourself with explosives strap your wife with explosives no no there's no organized good here you understand there's no organized good you don't the Ulma has not organized itself systematically to oppose this systematically organized, sophisticated evil. They can't do it. And there's nobody who is going to throw and Allah's going to throw with him. Where is that person? No. no. So what's happening? There's a panic. You see it, where, you know, all these... Uh, these men are at the, the mosque, you know, there's an absence of women there, it's just all men. And what are they doing when the Jews come? Are they standing there shoulder to shoulder? No, they're running. They're running away. Yeah. That's what I saw. Now, some have come to their senses and are prepared to die now, a few, but most of them are running away. So it's like I said, if you're going to, you either sit down or you walk away. Don't run away. Allah doesn't like cowards. Do not run away. Walk away. Yeah, they come because of peer pressure or because of the flags or whatever, and then start running once they hear the bullets. What the, the point of it is, is that there's no organization to fight them, you see? The, the people who are best organized are the Iranians, the Pakistanis, uh, they're a little bit better organized militarily. The Iranians are as well. But, you know, you've got the Sunni Shia divide, and that's preventing uh, people from uh, working together. It's, pre it's preventing Muslim brothers from working together. The, the Quran makes it very clear. and. Uh, the prophet made it very clear, yeah, uh, the things that you, and, and so did several of the, uh, the scholars, the old, the ancient scholars, they said, look, Allah's going to clarify the things that you differ about in the hereafter. In the here, <laughs> unity is important. Unity is important. So, yeah, I may not uh, agree with the Shia doctrine, if I meet a Shia on the street or at a restaurant, he gives me the salam, I'm going to salam him. I'm going to invite him, sit down and eat with me. I'm not going to argue about these things. It's, not, it's pointless. It's pointless. So the people who are organized are the ones who have not embraced Salafism, have not embraced the Muslim Brotherhood. You see? And why are they organized? Well, you can say, well, there's an element of uh, controlled opposition there. I know that as a matter of fact. Okay. And yes, we all know the Iranians are saying, raising their saddles and they're going to be sorry. They're going to be sorry. Well, the PLO has been saying the same thing for 30 years. You're going to be sorry. We are going to be sorry. And what the, <laughs> a few rockets drop. Nothing happens but a retaliation that kills hundreds and maims thousands. Or retaliation from the US when they invade on behalf of traitors 
Muslim leaders, whom these same people are complaining about what's going on in Jerusalem on behalf of their leaders, whom they're supporting. You see, that brings us to another problem. If you're supporting someone in office who is supporting the enemy of your cause or the cause of Allah, is Allah gonna honor your prayer? <laughs> I don't think so. Liars are not permitted in heaven. So when you're making that kind of a prayer, you're kind of a liar, aren't you? Why, why? Go, oh, oh, oh Allah, please help us. Da, 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 da. No, I don't want to talk about my murderous, thieving leader whom I'm supporting and whose flag I, I salute every day. I don't want to talk about that, but please help me anyway, okay? Please. No, oh, this is hypocrisy. Allah hates hypocrites, Allah hates cowards, Allah hates liars, Allah hates male chauvinists who beat their women. You people in the Goma, you better wake up. <laughs> if I'm giving a Ramadan message, this would be it. See? So, in answer to your question, brother, I think I came circle here. Sit down, prepare to die, get your piece Don't of bark, move. or walk away in peace. There's nothing else can be done in Jerusalem now. The more there is a reactionary movement on the part of people who are not organized, who are just the mob, and then they mob, take advantage. Of the worst it's going to get. The worst, the worst the reactions are going to get on the part of those who are organized. Okay, so let the king of Jordan raise his sword. You're going to be sorry. Let the PLO say you're going to be sorry. Let them fire off a few rockets. Let the Iranian general, you know, say you're going to be sorry. We're going to send some. Patrol boats out there and fire off a few firecrackers. That's what I called it. <laughs> That's exactly what I called it. I called it, it's firecrackers versus real weapons. Yes, yes, they don't have, well, the Iranians have some real weapons. And if they were really true about what they had to say, if they got together with the other forces in Lebanon and uh, Syria, and they unified themselves, they could, they could destroy Israel within an hour. Within an hour. All that the, reminds me of the statement where Moses said, let's go. And they're like, no, you yeah. can just walk oh, in. No, no, you yeah. just do it. No, you can just walk you, in. No, they said, you do it. <laughs> yeah. and they said to Musa, you do it. No. They said, you do it. We're, we're too afraid. We're too afraid. And we're too divided. So that's my answer to the situation. The rock can take care of itself. Al-Aqsa is not necessary. The prophet, when he ascended from Jerusalem, there was no Al-Aqsa there, and that's not the temple anyway. You see, it's not the temple of Suleiman. Jerusalem is, I'm not saying Jerusalem. And in and of itself is just a symbol. It's a symbol of the kingdom that Allah intended to restore with Muhammad as a promise, as a fulfilled promise to Ibrahim. And it was restored. The Muslims had it, then they lost it. It's lost now. And it's probably not coming back until Isa comes and there's a great slaughter, including the great slaughter of Muslims waiting to happen waiting to happen, okay? So the present Ummah, they're helpless and hapless. They cannot do anything about this without unity. And there's no, there's no leader to unify. So but I hope that uh, answers your question. No, you it's it very aptly. At least that's my perspective. Yeah. So, um, just to clarify, one of the brothers asked a question. So are you saying we should not fight? So just you can clarify that. One of the brothers on, online said, if, we're, if we don't have the strength, then we don't fight, or what do we do? Well, you don't have the strength to fight. You see, if you're going to fight, you have to have strength. You have to 
come from the position of strength. You can't come from a position of chaos. You can't step in the ring with Muhammad Ali as a weakling. Mm. You know, it does that, you know, you, you want to face Mike Tyson? Go on. <laughs> you know, you 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 do some boxing checks. You want to face him? <laughs> huh? No. What you what we're talking about is a mouse, you know, facing the lion. Now the mouse can face the lion if, if they're his, organized. If, if his faith if his faith is organized and his 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 body politic is organized and the faith is in order and Allah is prepared to throw with them. The angels are prepared to throw with them, but that's not the case now. It's not. That's not the case. There's too much sin in the body of the Ummah. There's too much sin. There's too many liars. There's too many fornicators. There's too much murder and thievery and taking place. Amongst themselves. Amongst themselves. Allah's not going to honor this. This is dishonor. This is a dishonoring of the of the religion. This is a dishonoring of the way of Islam. Allah's not going to help people like that. I'm reminded of uh, the women who came out into the street in Baghdad after the bombings, and they said, where is the God of Muhammad? Well, I'm sorry to say this, but you were married to the wrong men. Yeah, I saw that video where the sister was yes. saying that. Married to the wrong men because these men did not uphold justice, and because they did not uphold justice, just like Genghis Khan did, George Bush sent his people in and destroyed their families. Yeah. It's the same lesson. So, the, one of the lessons I'm getting from this yes. if you are men and you're not organized, you're useless. Useless, yeah. You, you, where are your good deeds? You're, you're only doing them at Ramadan. You're depending on your zakat. Where are your good deeds? The angels of death is going to ask you, where are your good deeds? Where are they? Oh, I said, I said, alhamdulillah, 30, 300,000 times in my lifetime. The angel's not worried about that. The angel wants to know, where are your good deeds? Where are they? Yeah, and they were worried. Why will you make someone who's going to cross bloodshed and, and chaos? That was their <laughs> yes. question. That's yes. interesting. Yes. So this is how I perceive this. It's it's not a it's not a good position for the Ummah to be in. And so I'm we not, need to retreat, organize, repent. Repent. <laughs> repent first of all. Repent first of all. Repentance is the very first step in self-defense because there is no self-defense without Allah's help. And there's no Allah's help unless you repent. It's very simple. You don't have to be a genius to work this out. Huh? Believe me, I'm no genius. I'm just an ordinary guy who worked it out with Allah's help. You know, I read the old scriptures. I read the Quran. I said, "Why, my God, this is very, very simple." I said, "Why aren't these people following the, the the plan? The plan's right there, step by step, by step by step. It's all right there, and nobody's following it." And when Omar Mukhtar was challenged, and he stood up and he followed the plan, nobody helped him. So, May Allah have mercy upon the Ummah. Yeah, so, and then, it, I always found about Umar Mukhtar, one of the interesting things is that how he allowed himself in the end to be kind of like arrested. And he was at peace with being hung. Well. And he kind of like made a show of it almost, it seems like. Well, he, you know, after 20 years, 25 years, he, he knew what the odds were. And the, the odds were less and less and less in his favor. Allah let that be lengthened that period in or as a mercy for the Ummah to come and help him. That might have turned the tide, you see. But they did not, they abandoned.
And he knew he was abandoned. And at that last moment, he just said, well, there's no point in going on anymore. Maybe he was feeling too old to fight anymore. Mm. He's just a man after all. Mm. And he was, you know, 70 years old. I don't know how old he was when he, when his life was ended, but uh, in any case, he would not let them kill him. Yeah. yeah. He would not permit that. He stepped off himself as an act of faith and as a lesson for the world. Yeah. yeah. So he said, maybe my death will wake them up. Maybe my death will wake them up. They haven't woken up. They have not woken up. People are still pretending to be pious. They're still pretending to do what is good. And what is really good is justice. Justice and faith yeah. is a key. Read the heights. It's very clear. They're more important than prayer. More important. So if all you have is prayer, when you enter the grave, I'm afraid you're in trouble. If you've abandoned justice, you're in trouble. If you have not stood up to defend the weak and the defenseless and the poor, your prayers are meaningless. Your faith is dead. Yeah, it just then is a myth in the sense that there's no execution. Yeah. Like that. We all love protectors and help us to be organized. Alhamdulillah. Well, that's another subject. This goes back into your talk. Yes. So. Yeah. All right, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I'm going to end the conversation here. I will try to upload this to the YouTube, inshallah, and then so everyone can hear along with uh, some of my own commentary. I think this was pretty clear. Jazakumullah khairan for coming. I know I just said that at the last moment. And uh, alhamdulillah. Uh, okay. If, if there's something in there that uh, needs your commentary, please do. Okay. Because uh, there, there are people who will be listening. But unless a particular scholar comes in and says, oh, yes, this is the hadith. This is the passage. This is what supports what this uh, strange player named Omar Zaid is saying. Okay? So I'm not just talking out of the blue. That's why we're together. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Are your own leaders giving you justice? If, you, if the leaders of you are giving you justice, then you can expect the help of Allah. If this will not happen, that your leaders are unjust, and then now on this emotional issue, that you think the help of Allah will come. It's not going to happen. First, you need to establish justice within jama'ah, within. And the Prophet told us, وسلم, the people of this area of the Holy Land, they will not give up the struggle and the resistance till the till the coming of Isa alayhi They will continue their struggle till the end, inshallah. But you have to be in a position where, what? You have to be in a position where the divine help is coming to you. And when will the divine help come to you? The divine help will come to you when this, situa this situation is not the case. Do you believe in part of the book? And you reject the other? What can be the reward of the people who take this attitude? You want the help of Allah, but none of your laws are according to the book of Allah. You're dealing in the same riba. The same riba system is there for which Allah has declared war. The same riba system is there and you now 
want to defend and you want to Allah's help to come. This is why there needs to be a proper tawbah from the top to the bottom and every family has to know in the end they are alone. You have to make your stand alone. You have to make your stand on the doorsteps of Al-Aqsa like the Prophet said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm going to have, inshallah, if Allah wills, I might have a longer talk which actually show these narrations and go over them, the ones that I'm talking about. But I think many of the uh, brothers and sisters have already read in their well-known narrations of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And again, I want to reiterate the importance of protecting this place is paramount, paramount to the whole ummah. And so, we have to do proper tawbah. We have to get right with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to leave those very systems that you think that when it, it cannot be that for the masjid you're standing up and willing to give your life, but you're also accepting the economic system and the political system and all other systems that are in some level being in, in, uh, you know, in colonized onto you, pushed onto you, but you have to be in a state of protest against the whole system, number one. Number two, you sh should not attack. No. Rather, the sunnah away is you let them be the aggressors and you make sure the world sees it. And until then, you do tawbah and you do sabr and you do sabr and you do sabr. The Prophet had to do sabr with all the companions being, with all the companions of the Prophet that were being persecuted, right? With all the companions of the Prophet being persecuted until the Prophet said, okay, maybe I need to do da'wah outside Mecca. Let me go to the city of Ta'if. And we know what happened with the Prophet ﷺ in the city of Ta'if. He didn't get the response he was hoping for, وسلم. And he did that dua, that heart-breaking dua. But that dua, that dua is the one that began to change the situation. Anta Rabbul Mustad'afeen. Wallah, you're the Rabb of the oppressed. Allahumma inni ashku ilayka du'fati. Oh Allah, I complain to you of my weakness. You have to be vulnerable rather than stubborn. You have to be vulnerable rather than arrogant. And you have to realize that when you're weak, you need to be able to say, yes, we are weak. Unfortunately, we are weak and we need to do things according to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ when we are weak. We need to buy time. We need to grow a new generation, a generation that is ready to deal with. And I want to tell my brothers and sisters in the holy uh, place that I do not take that, you know, the thing that they're trying to put into you. Okay, don't do that. Don't don't take that the thing that starts with V. Don't put that into you. Okay, don't put that into you because whoever will put that into themselves, okay, they're going to be weak health wise tomorrow. And so the fact that I think it has not come to many of the brothers and sisters in that area is in fact a blessing from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And so I'll end here for today. The point is that how does David beat Goliath? David beats Goliath by being extremely organized and by seeking the divine help. And what happened? Now let me end by mentioning this very quickly. That, uh, you know, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Bani Israel was being under an onslaught from left, right and center. People would come and take their things and their resources and they were fed up, were willing to fight in the cause of Allah. So they said, Give us a king so we can fight in the cause of Allah. Then what happened? He said, In Allah ba'atha ta'alutha malika, look, Allah has made this man your king. He has no wealth. How can he be a king? How can there be a king that has no, no money? 
No, the Prophet of Allah said, look, you have to be with him. So half the people, they just went aside because they didn't like the person. Can you see that happening in our ummah today? Then, you know, they then they go into the battlefield and he says, you can't, in Allah muqtaliku bin nahr, Allah is going to test you with this river, right? And majority of the people drank from that river. Okay, and so now you have smaller, you already had a small force, now you have a smaller force, and now that small force continues. And now they're in the battlefield. And over there, when they saw the huge army of Goliath, they said, Today we don't have the power to fight against Janut and his army. It's too powerful. But then there was a smaller group of them that said, How many of a small group defeated the larger group by the permission of Allah? And what was the secret to that? The secret to that was sabr. And this is why the dua that's given after this, the people in those small group of people who said, how many small people have defeated a large people, right? How many small people have defeated a large people? They said, رَبَّنَا أَفْرِغْ عَلَيْنَا صَبْرًا Allah, just pour down sabr on us. Pour it down, sabr, sabran. رَبَّنَا أَفْرِغْ عَلَيْنَا صَبْرًا وَثَبِّتْ أَقْدَامَنَا وَنْصُنَّا عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ And make our steps firm. Are your steps firm? As a family, as a community, as a jama'ah, as a people, are your steps firm today? Or are you a muntashir? One person thinking one thing, another person thinking another thing, one person. There's no, there's no ifbat, there's no strength, there's no, there's no sakina in the sense of you ha you're under the, you know you're under the will of Allah and you're doing sabr and you're waiting for the help of Allah to come and you're doing what you're supposed to do at a time where no Muslim ummah in the Muslim ummah, no leader, no one is going to help you. No one's going to come for your help. And the fire crackers that we're going to throw over are just going to create a worse situation as they do every year. And then some people will say, well, that's all we can do, so that's what we have to do. I'm saying that's what you have to do because you don't have sabr. Your job is to stay at the doors of Al-Aqsa and protect it. Your job is to have sabr. Your job is to do tawbah and ask Allah for help. And to really trust Allah that Allah will provide that help. If you are weak, you have to accept your fate. Until that time where if you are in the truth and you are weak and you are in the divine order, then the help of Allah will come. Because no one was weaker than the Prophet was, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was in Mecca and he was put in a prison for three, three years where he was basically under a type of house arrest and where they were planning to kill him until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make a makhraja for him and all of a sudden he's in Medina. But first you have to get right with Allah. You have to accept the laws of Allah. You have to start making your... You cannot expect the help of Allah and yet be breaking his major, major commandments like riba. You have to get right with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. I remember, see, I, w I used to think that being oppressed means, being oppressed means that you're going to be more closer to Allah. When I went to the Holy Land in 1994, I realized that's not always the case. And so when I was in the Holy Land, I was by the grave of some of the companions of the Prophet Wasallam, And in that area, there was one man smoking. One Palestinian brother, he was smoking. Okay, and what happened? As he was smoking, I said to him, Brother, this is, you know, the graves of the companions of the Prophet Wasallam." So, you know, maybe, you know, I was young then, you know, so I didn't really think much other than what I was thinking. I told them you need to, you know, move a little bit away because this is, uh, you know, respect the companions of the Prophet Don't be smoking like here. 
So he said, brother, I'm already dead. I'm already dead. I'm already like, I'm already in my grave. I just, I'm not, meaning, meaning, this is the attitude. This is not the attitude of the believers. And many times we take to this attitude in the name of the deen. We take to this attitude that I'm already dead in the negative sense, not in the religious sense, not in the spiritual sense. And so learn to stand up and learn to defend your own and learn to defend the doors of Al-Aqsa and learn to have sabr and learn to wait till the help of Allah comes because it will come but it will not come as long as you are in disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's unfortunately the hard reality of our situation see when Muslims were good then we had Abu Bakr and Umar and so on and so forth if we are not doing good, if we don't, if Allah didn't give us dunya, because Allah said, Inni fil ardi khalifa, I want to make a khalifa on earth. Then these people, they commit to Allah, and then the angels say they're going to cause fasad in the world. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows them, the people will cause fasad in the world. Then don't expect you as the representatives of Allah, who are supposed to be the khalifas of Allah, if you are also going to do the same thing, you're going to be involved in the same haram riba, the same oppressive riba, if you're going to be involved in the same uh, international alliance as everyone else, if you're going to be doing all the same things that any other Muslim country is already doing, you're just going to be another nation state. If you're going to be just another nation state, just another name to add into the list of uh, Muslim countries, so-called, uh, that have basically abandoned Islam as their lifestyle, if you want to be just, if, if your goal is just to be you know, a hurriya, a freedom of a nation state. You know, we have our place, we have our national flags. And if you want to do that, then don't expect the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't expect it. Because that's not what the help of Allah will come for. Okay? So, I think I said my piece for today. Let's see how this... Um, this feature that where I upload is able to deal with this. Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.